Almighty and Eternal Father, we again we come to thy presence to worship you in spirit and in truth. Thankful for the revelation of thy spirit that causes us to know that we are thy children, that bears witness with us that we are the children of the eternal God. We thank thee, our Father, for the assurance which you have given unto us through thy word of thy plan and thy purpose in the earth. Is that what you intend to do with thy children and thy sons and thy daughters? As such, our Father, grant unto us that we might receive the guidance and the vision which out of thy word and through the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit we make known unto thy children that which you would have them to do. We pray for the coming of thy kingdom in fullness and in power. We recognize that we are a part of a great continuing stream of life which has come forth from thy throne into the earth to build thy kingdom. We pray, our Father, for the binding of the darkness that would destroy, for the loosening of the light that comes forth from thy household, and for the declaration of thy truth. We pray for the spiritual center of thy kingdom, thy church, that it might fully reduce in its responsibility as thy oracle unto the people of thy household. We pray for the nations of thy kingdom in its hour, that leadership might be granted unto them as will be guided by thy word and by thy law, so we'll recognize and understand that responsibility of the earth as thy established household. We pray, our Father, for the removal of all leadership that would not do thy will, that would submit us to the powers of darkness, and would seek to appease evil. Grant unto us men of faith that will denounce evil, that will take the standards of thy direction, that will resist it, knowing that you will go before and deliver into our hands the powers that would destroy until we have cleansed the earth. We pray, our Father, that as we survey the things which are before us, that faith which can proceed only out of the knowledge of thee and thy plan, shall not only give unto us that assurance and serenity of spirit which comes from having our minds in balance with thy vision, praying now that all thy household, understanding and awakening out of their sleep, shall perform the task which you have ordained them to do. Knowing that this shall be brought to pass, we shall fulfill the destiny which is thy purpose, we commit ourselves to thy hands, saying thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And we ask this. Yeah. This afternoon, as we discuss the subject of the great treasures of your race, we'd like to pick up again the biblical theme that relates to you and your origin and your destiny. We were speaking on this subject last Sunday afternoon. We dealt with a great number of facts that go back into the antiquities. Situations that related to the earth before your race was ever resting upon it. Conditions that transpired before even the world was framed. We would like to only recount a few facts and predicate the continuation of these remarks again upon them that you are the children of the Most High God. And we what really mean that you are the children of the Most High God. That as we turn to the words of the Apostle Paul writing in Romans, he refers to the revelation of God's Spirit, which bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. His Spirit bearing witness with our spirit from the words which he has spoken, from the facts which are revealed in the course of the scripture and concerning the patterns of history, we are the household of the Most High. And there is all through the writings of the Apostle Paul and the records of the Old Testament and its patriarchs is the confirmation of this fact, that the essence of the spirit that resides in your physical body was begotten of the Father before the world was framed. It was a spiritual life and a spiritual begetting you are the children of the Spirit of the Eternal. We have a word, an old word, which we have united in our theology, and that word is the word Christ. The word Christ comes from the Greek word Christos, but it means the embodiment of deity. In fact, that word can be found in many languages, and it is relating entirely to the embodiment of the household of the Most High God. When we use the word Jesus Christ, Christ was not his name, it was a statement concerning what he was. This was Yahshua, or the eternal God embodied in a physical body. That's one of the reasons why, again, the embodiment of the spirits of the Most High, or the spirit of the Most High in a physical body, is thus given that word. 
in the word Christos in the Greek, we discover uh, that this is the parallel to the word that the tall Manu or the Edians, which are your relatives in earlier days of earth history, uh, used, they used it in Persian and in Greek and, uh, forms, they used it in Latin forms, and they used it, of course, in the early uh, Coptic Aramaic. And the constant thought was the incarnate embodiment of God. The word Messiah looked forward to the embodiment of God. But this was only the embodiment of God's ultimate revelation. But the word Christ itself meant the embodiment of the Spirit of the Eternal. That's the reason why the Apostle Paul tells us uh, that Christ in you is not only the hope of glory, but this is one of the great mysteries that is hidden today from the world order. This is one of the things that the world order roundabout does not understand, but it is now made known, the Apostle Paul said unto you, uh, says unto you, uh, this mystery made known unto you is that Christ in you is the hope of glory, of light, of radiation, of all the majesty uh, that God has declared will take place in his people. He said, I am a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me to fulfill the word of God. Even the mysteries which have been hidden from the ages and from the generations and is now made manifest in his saints. The word saint comes from Santesh, meaning breathing offspring. So every individual that is a saint of the Most High God is a breathing offspring of the Most High God. It's not merely a pattern of acceptance of a religious idea or principle. It does, it does not come by the process of joining an institution. An individual to be qualified as a saint of the Most High God is a believing offspring. That does not mean that this individual has a particular type of righteousness uh, that is greater than any of his fellows. For every individual who is a descendant of the Most High and who dwells in physical bodies in the earth today is sanctest and is a offspring of the Most High. But to qualify fully for the word saint, it means believing offspring. So in other words, every one of your race that breathes the words of the Father is a breathing offspring is a saint. Now, in Colossians, we read these words. Therefore, even the mystery which has been hidden from all the ages and from the generations is now made manifest in his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of his glory, this mystery among the nations, that it is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Therefore, the Apostle Paul was declaring something that even translation does not give full and complete uh, revelation to. And that is that one of the great mysteries of all time is the transference of the children of God from celestial planes to a physical realm. That this was conducted by a, a miracle of the Most High, and we have entered the world by the process of birth. We brought nothing into the world, we have been told, in the ritual of the church. We take nothing out of the world but that which came in, which actually was the spirit with its capacity and its consciousness. We told you last Sunday afternoon that you were with the Father before the world was framed. In fact, you stood with the Father according to Job, as God revealed it unto Job when the solar system was formed. You sang together with all the rest of the children of the Most High God and the archangels that were serving before the throne of the Most High God. And you rejoiced at each new creation. And therefore we placed you in origin and beginning back several million years ago and said uh, that you have a timelessness about your spiritual consciousness and it doesn't mark you with merely three score years and ten of an earth's existence as men's expectancy have outlined it for them but relate you to the endless past in which your father has been creating and making the things of his desire. It is one of the great truths of the scripture that uh, you not only beheld the works of the Father in this age of creation, uh, but you eventually volunteered for the task which God had ordained, and you came into a world which was upset by a fallen archangel, Lucifer. If you go through the records of the 12th chapter of the record of Revelation, and then all the woven through the scriptures, you'll discover that there were ancient struggles fought in the heavens. The Michael the archangel defeated Lucifer, and he was cast to the earth. Here in earth, with his forces with which he had waged a war over millenniums and over uh, countless ages, we discover that the powers of evil were finally concentrated into this solar system. If you would understand the mysteries that relate to you, you must recognize that, uh, that we have been placed in the earth by the will of our Father. When we tell you that one of the, the subjects this afternoon is the treasure which your race possesses, we point out that in prior experience, your race existed in the planes of spirit. 
that it is true that some of your kinsmen, sons and daughters in the celestial plane of the Most High God, have been upon the earth in the ancient past, and that you served in spiritual temples, temples which were framed and formed of the materials of earth, but invisible to the natural eye, you served as the spiritual beings and as divine influences in the areas of the pre-Adamic earth and in the catastrophe that enveloped ancient continents such as the sinking of the areas of the mid-Atlantic and the mid-Pacific, you as a race and as a people uh, had not yet been existing in the earth, but the peoples of earth who had violated ancient laws and who had watched the catastrophe sweep upon them in the days of Lucifer's era, uh, recorded in their own writings, in their own history, especially those that turned from this darkness and appealed to the eternal God about how they had served in temples and how the sons of the eternal Yahweh had administered in these temples and at times their light and their radiance could be seen, but their words and their voices could be heard, and how there had been an assurance given unto them that the day would come again when uh, the sons and the daughters of God would serve again in the earth as priests and as kings before the Most High God. That's why the ancient writings of the book of us, uh, which is the foundation of all history in Egypt and is the background of its oldest patterns of theology, tell about how they migrated, of course, from the sinking lands that went down beneath the waters to find their place uh, where now today Egypt is along the banks of the River Nile. And when they settled there, there were other parts of Africa most luxurious with grass and with foliage, all of which is told about in the ancient books of us. But the thing they waited for was the coming of the, the, the sons and daughters of the Most High to again point them to light and to truth. Now, this is a part of the record of other races that look forward to the coming of the Adamic race or to the white race when it came. One of the oldest words in human language is Adam because that means white man. And the word Adam found all through the scriptures always means white man. The word Enosh means other races or beings. Both of these words are translated as you go through the scripture man. But that's only because the, in the scholarship of the King James Version, at the time they produced it, they did not uh, perceive that they should have separated these in their proper relationship. That explains the reason why the things which Jesus said always come to pass, but there are several things that have been translated that have not taken place. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And you look around and say, well, Asia didn't come, Africa didn't come. But you take a look at who has received the recognition of Messiah. Every white nation on the face of the earth today is a Christian nation. The white race has received this. Therefore, what Jesus said is true. If I be lifted up, I draw all human unto me. Now, he didn't say, I'll draw all the Enoch. He said, I'll draw all the Adamites. These are the sons of God in the earth. We must, in time, use certain patterns of repetition and use of the scriptures because the volume never grows old and it requires it in its arrangement of thought from sermon to sermon. Therefore, remember that the Apostle Paul, uh, in his writings in Corinthians, refers to the incarnate embodiment of God, which we refer to as the man Christ Jesus, as the second Adam. Why does he refer to him as the second Adam? Because this is the embodiment of the Son, or the life, or the Spirit of God. And therefore, Adam, who was the father of your race, and who was the offspring of the Most High God in the flesh, because the father had brought forth an issue, and the Hebrew words explain that, that the issue of God was Adam. And therefore, we remember that Eve was formed out of Adam. We are told it was a rib. Actually, the original text said that God separated out of Adam the female portion and produced Eve, and they were his offspring and his life. Now we note that the scripture uh, relates to Adam, and Adam was not the first man, and Adam was not the only man. He was the first son of the living God to ever be embodied in a physical body. This was the first time that a child of the Spirit resided in a physical body to establish the line of the kingdom that God had ordained would never be destroyed and eventually would bring in his administration from one end of the earth to the other. It is important that the Bible, which is a specifically a book for your race, be understood so that the responsibilities of divine direction, the patterns of history and our relationship uh, with our Father in the earth be properly understood. When we talk about the uniqueness of uh, this experience, we also cite to you that as you have come into the world, 
and have been born into the Adamic family, that all through the scripture you have uh, the relationship to that Adamic origin brought out. Uh, from time to time there are those who would contest this because they do not know and do not understand what the Bible contains. That the Asiatic races and the Negroid race were upon the earth before your arrival is also predicated upon the contents of the 31st chapter of the book of Ezekiel, the writings also of Jeremiah that tell us about the Assyrian which was present before uh, the periods of the history that affect Eden in your race. In the 31st chapter, we discover uh, that not only Eden, but also Pharaoh and uh, the land of Egypt existed before your race came along. Remember that the word of Pharaoh and the title of the Pharaohs originally was Khufu. That's the oldest word for a reigning ruler that comes out of the ancient Atlantean thinking and is found tied in in its form with other places of the earth as well. It was an old word. It meant Pharaoh or ruler. And Pharaoh, which is the word later applied to the rulers of Egypt, uh, was only another use of a title of administration. But the word Khufu was one of the oldest words for the rulers over Egypt. And Horus was a high priest of ancient Egypt. The reason why we are interested in the records of Horus that come out of the ancient temples of Karanak that were quoted by Menthos, the high priest, who referred to later by Herodotus as he wrote about Egyptian history is that if we want to go back to beginnings and find out the facts, we have to go back to contemporaries who wrote about those facts, and especially before your arrival. They waited for the day. Now these Egyptians, we well recognize, had watched the great pollution affect their ancient society. They watched what happened as the intermingling of the mongrelization of races and fallen angels sought to mongrelize the whole world and to establish a dynasty to cold the earth against an eventual attempted overthrow by the Most High. Remember that Lucifer remembered the words and he knew the instruction. For out of the ancient past he had been told that God would plant his own family in the earth. That that family would eventually overthrow his darkness and evil and that the world and all the solar system that he had taken refuge in would be liberated from his era. So therefore his design was to mix the world up and to hold it in bondage as far as possible and to propagate a people that would serve before him. That's the reason why fallen angels didn't keep their first estate, as you're told in the book of Jude. They intermingled with Asiatics, they intermingled with Negroids and others, and they produced an unassimilatable people. But a people that controlled their temples and their priesthoods and sought to teach all the darkness of evil. Superstition, idol worship, pagan processes filled the earth, but there was no man upon it. Yes, ancient creations had gone through a disaster and a chaos, and God had said there was no Adamite to till the soil. There was no Adamite upon the earth, even though, as we have referred to you, the, six, the first verses of the book of Genesis tell about how there had been a creation and every species and kind were created, and men were created in the sixth, in the sixth day of Genesis. And Adam and his race were not prepared for the earth until the seventh day. While God was resting, God now said, now there's no man to till the soil. And so he put Adam upon the earth. Actually, whether you know it or not, you're a seventh day issue of the Most High God. And that well should be, for seven is a divine number. And six is not the number for God's household, but is the number that's always in its triology, the assembly of the beast. Remember that when God talks about the beast order, it's people that are not begotten of spirit, but were dwellers with soul consciousness in the earth. It was all right as long as they served archangels that served God. It was all right as far as their status was concerned, as long as they remained in balance. But a rebellious archangel took over the earth, and then these people were taught darkness and superstition and evil. They lacked the spiritual guidance of a spiritually embodied son to know and to respond and to understand. God's plan understood this from the beginning, and he had made a way of preparation. It would be his own household, his own sons, and his own daughters. In fact, from that day to this, the whole vibratory field of conflicting energies and the planes of thought and of consciousness have been struggling and have been in resistance and in expectation according to who they were. There were ancient prophecies made, even like these prophecies that were given to the children of ancient Egypt when they migrated from the sinking Atlantis. And we use that term because they use that term. They called the land that went down beneath the waters Atlantis. And that's why Plato, when he was educated in Egypt, he called it Atlantis. So we'll call it Atlantis too because the land uh, that went down went beneath the waters of the ocean. We've named Atlantic because it's on top. Now the fact remains that they tell why their land sank, they tell how it sank. 
and they tell about the fact that the spiritual sons that served in the great pyramid temples on their high mountains left, but they were told they would come back again. And when they came back, they would dwell in bodies just exactly like the peoples of earth. And that when this happened, they would be a living priesthood, and they would be the developing rulers of the kingdom of Yahweh in the earth. Now that's the reason why that ancient Egypt anticipated the coming someday of your race. That's one of the reasons why Khufu, who was the pharaoh of the days of Horus and the dynasties that followed, were receptive to Enoch and Job. When these two white patriarchs of God fulfilled their heavenly instructions, went down and built the city of On and started the erection of the great pyramids. And remember, irrespective of the attempts of some pyramidologists to try to say that it was built by a later pharaoh named Cheop, and they call him Khufu too, and they think that this was a man that lived at a much later period. The pyramid age still belongs back to 440 to, to 4,400 to 4,000 B.C. And it is still true that the word Cheop was the Greek word for the pharaoh, but Khufu was not one man. Khufu was a series of men. As the first ancient pharaoh of Egypt in the days of Horus before any white man walked the earth was called Khufu. The thing that's significant here is that these pharaohs, under the guidance of the ancient doctrines of Horus and the things which were a part of their remembrance, they were welcoming the coming of your race. And later men folks, who served before the dark temples of Satan and was known as Seti, Seti and Thoth, he looked upon any pharaoh that wouldn't serve Satan and would serve your God as having been captured by an ignoble people. And so he writes, the pharaoh of our land was captured by these ignoble people who are white of countenance, who are the children of Osiris, the call of Ra, and they captured our pharaoh without the use of weapons, but they captured him in his mind, for he accepted that they had come for this mission. So therefore, remember that always the world order looks upon the children of God as an ignoble people. But just remember that they admitted there was something that your race had greater than they could combat, and even the Pharaoh, with expectancy of prophecy, received and permitted the development of destiny, which was the building of on the erection of the pyramid, even lending all the assistance which he could lend to the forebearers uh, of these great truths. Now the fact remains that with this background and with this history, they recognized something that was taught by Enoch and Job. When they said that you were the children of Osiris, the call of Ra, they said you were the children of the Most High God who would be embodied in the earth and who was the very soul of the God of life. For the Ka is the Egyptian word for soul, and Ra was, the, uh, was what they referred to as the God of light. And while they also called the sun Ra, they actually were not worshiping the sun. In their theology, they had marked the sun as the symbol of a God whose universe was ruled by light and by the righteousness of his personality. But they were not the worshipers of Ra. They were the worshipers of Sete and Thoth and the dark gods of the underworld because Lucifer's pagan doctrines had taken ancient Egypt long before the Adamic race was placed upon the face of the earth. That's another reason why, significantly then, what they testified to was that you were the children of the Lord of life and resurrection. That's what Osiris means, the Lord of life and resurrection. So whereas death had moved upon the earth by violations of divine law, and this death was upon all peoples, so also in your own Adamic race, when Adam violated divine law, death came upon your race. But there were prophecies, and there were expectations that had been pronounced by uh, the patriarchs, the very entrance of God into their lives again in the earth, as he made promises unto them, had promised that he, the eternal God, would become incarnate in their midst, that he would make an atonement that would save his people from both their transgression as well as its penalty and who had turned them loose with spiritual power and light to get in the earth. Because this was true, it was taught by Adam, it was taught by Seth, it was taught by Enoch, it was taught by Job. Job knew that Christ would stand upon the earth being embodied God. He said, I know in latter days my Redeemer will stand upon the earth, and I know that my Redeemer will it. And I know that though the worms consume this body, yet with these eyes will I behold him upon the earth in latter days. So he believed in a resurrection because it was a doctrine of our race. And he, the Egyptians bore testimony that it was when they called you the children of the Lord of life and resurrection. That's why there was a struggle in the ancient theology of Egypt between the Lord of life and the resurrection and the dark doctrine of Seth and of Saul. 
It's a rather interesting thing, therefore, when they said that inside of you is the soul or life and spirit of the eternal God of light and of the universe. No wonder Malachi talks about the nature of the eternal Father and said the Son of Righteousness that rises with healing in his wings. The winged orb was upon the stamp and uh, the katash of Joseph when he was in the land of Egypt. One of the emblems of his own personal seal was the winged orb. That winged orb follows your race. It was on the wisdom schools of your ancient temples. It was to be beheld in temples of Tadanak. It was to be seen upon the altar where the two pillars uh, were to lead forth in the symbols of divine ceremony. It was a rather significant thing that the scripture recognizes this emblem as one that was identified with your race early. And so Malachi says, the son of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. And the winged orb uh, was a significant emblem of that. It was to be found wherever your race migrated. It was to be found in Scandinavia. The symbol of the winged orb was found in its ancient wisdom schools. It was found among the Druids in the side of Britain. It was found uh, among the uh, peoples uh, of central Germany and along the Rhine, the winged orb, and with it certain emblems. One of the oldest emblems in the world is the swastika, by the way, as it turns with the sun. Strange as it might seem, it was a symbol of the eternal rotation of the light of life through the fields of the people that God had raised up. The winged orb is to be seen in Washington, D.C., on the faces of several of your buildings, together with the symbol of the vine, and that vine is the olive branch. I just want you to remember this relative to its symbolism in your race. You will discover that wherever the white race, the Israel of God, go, it is the olive branch, not the fig branch, that marks God's kingdom. You can go down Beverly Boulevard and take a look at the synagogue down there, and you'll see olive branches. All uh, You'll see no olive branches. You'll see fig branches and serpents woven in the six-pointed star. Well, that's not the emblem of God's kingdom. For the fig tree is never going to bear any fruit ever again forever. It's already cursed and it's marked. The bad figs create anarchy and trouble and catastrophe in the world because they are the children of Lucifer and a part of the remnant of those descendants of the earliest violations of divine law that have taken place upon the face of the earth. Whereas your race are the children of the Most High, you are the children of the Living Father, and you possess something that no other people on the face of the earth possess. More than that, as you understand this, there will move over you in the midst of the conflict that faces you, in the midst of the contest that makes uh, the very processes of life in which you live uh, would be wearisome were it not for this knowledge. And that is that as the children of the eternal God, you are a part upon a predestinated destiny of absolute victory over evil. Now, I can tell you more than this. Even though as we look at men and we see their physical bodies uh, and we behold them and they say all men uh, have more or less the same physical characteristics, let me tell you something, as we've mentioned before, you can look at cans too, and cans on the shelf are all round and they all have the same general shape, but there's a difference in the content. It is to your advantage in mind that there are labels on cans. Because the labels on cans are to help denote for us the content. And that's why there are labels on races. Some are black and some are yellow and some are white. But when you see the white label inside of that uh, content, it's supposed to be the child of the living God, the spiritual son who has been born of incorruptible seed. We who are twice born, having been born in the heavens and having been born in the earth, have now been begotten by a lively hope, we are told. For we were born of incorruptible seed that lives and abides forever. A living seed that cannot be destroyed. Can you corrupt the incorruptible? Absolutely not. Well, you say, I see misbehavior upon the part of white men. Yes, but every misbehavior that was ever made was made in the processes of temptation through the senses in this physical body. But the spirit within them has not violated divine law, for that was born of incorruptible seed, and it is the life of God. Eventually, it is the work of God that is going to bring the consummation of the destiny which he's ordained for you. You're told over here in the writings of the Apostle Paul that those he did foreknow, the book of Romans tells us, he did predestinate to conform to the very image of the Son, that even in the earth you, each one of you, shall dwell to the full confirmation and to the full configuration of the glory of Christ himself. That as God lived in the earth, so shall you live 
triumphantly bringing in the fullness of your destiny and help to bring in the majesty of God's kingdom. Well, you say, well, how do I know? There's been thousands of my race. They've died. They never accomplished this. They've passed on. Well, who told you they weren't going to finish the work which the fathers ordained? For every last one of the sons and daughters of your race are going to be raised up to stand upon their feet and develop with divine glory to finish the task they were sent to do. So it says, you mean I'm going to live again? You're never going to stop living. A lot of people have the idea, you know, that, that death is something that's going to happen to the children of God and their lost consciousness will be the emblem of death. There will never be a period of time when you're going to be dead. The only thing I see as dead is I see the bodies of many of God's children are sound asleep and they're just almost dead from the way they have been in inactivity when they should have been in positions of great leadership. Now when we refer to what God has purposed, he not only has predestinated you, he says, to conform to his own image, but he said you have been elect in his plan, predestinated, have been named and planned before the foundation of the world. He not only had written your names in his family book before you came into the world, but he has written down the destiny in which you shall conform to the image of the Son. I want you to remember that the words of Jesus, therefore, were not in any way out of measure. For inside of you, there is something that exists in no other race upon the face of the earth. Our enemies know this. Our enemies not only know it, but when we discuss this thing, or when people are brought to this awareness that they might fulfill their responsibility, our enemies stand back and stare and say, Master race. Our enemies have been continually staring at something they can't compete with. They point out and say, Master race. Well, that's right. It is a master race, and God placed it here to do a masterful job of establishing his kingdom with righteousness and ruling over it forever. Now, don't let the enemy coin up your semantics. He today has so taken his battle of semantics into position that he would have some people hanging their heads and trying to disallow their own inheritance. He'd like to have you disallow the name of Jesus Christ in your schools and in your nation, too, because he doesn't like that either. He doesn't like the fact that this is the eternal God before whom he shall also bow. For every knee is going to bow, and every tongue is going to proclaim that Christ, Jesus, Yahshua Christ, is the eternal Lord God forever. And they're going to know also that the Christ in you is going to be worthy of their respect. For inside these bodies are the living spirits of the eternal God. I can tell you something about that ancient pyramid temple that was built in Egypt. There was one in Asia. There was one in South America. There everywhere upon the whole face of the earth. There were temples under the eternal Yahweh in those early days. And men served and worshipped until Lucifer came into the earth. And the administration was a spiritual administration of the kinsmen of the Most High. Did you know God's not ashamed to call you his kinsmen? That's why the book of Hebrews continually brings this to your attention, that since the children of Yahweh were in bodies of flesh, he took upon himself a body just like they had, was not ashamed to call them his kinsmen. Knowing that you are kinsmen with God, knowing that you possess a capacity uh, that is different and distinct because that celestial being inside of you has a celestial mind. That celestial mind is the same wavelength as the mind of God, and that spirit is essence of his own spirit. So the essence of your celestial being is one with the being of God. You are light of his light, you are spirit of his spirit. That's why the apostle Paul said, did you know we have the mind of Christ? I will agree with you that most people don't act like it, but we have the mind of Christ. Inside of our celestial consciousness is a waking consciousness of divine presence, in which the very thoughts of God, the very patterns of tomorrow, are already in form. It is out of these facts that we discover that the ego soul consciousness, which is our resident awareness of dwelling in this body, that uses the sensitivity of the entire nervous system in the brain to function and to make your body behave, to do as you will, to make your hands work, your feet walk, it almost becomes subconscious action, you're so used to it. But remember that you're at the helm. You're dwelling in this body. That's why the Apostle Paul said there's an inner man and there's an outer man. The world beholds the outer man, but that inner man is the child of the eternal Father. Now we go a little farther with the declaration of what the Scripture says. The Apostle Paul tells us over here in Corinthians that this is one of the great keystones of the Christian faith. He said, therefore, we have an earthly house or tabernacle. This is our body. 
We know if this were to dissolve, disintegrate, fall apart, no longer to maintain the chemical balances of life, that we're not suddenly devoid of a place to dwell, because he says we want you to know that we have also a celestial body which is made eternally in the planes of spirit. Now this is what he says. What we are waiting for, therefore, we have a house, a building begotten of God. This house was not made with hands. It's not a building like this, but it's eternal in the dimensions of spirit. Now he said, we are vibrating together, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with the light of that house. Now he said, we don't want to die. This idea that we're just wanting to die, we don't want to die. Every once in a while you'll hear some uh, sanctimonious person say, my, they can't wait to die to go to heaven. But they never really practice that because they rush to the drugstore and to the doctor and everywhere else that they think they're about to go. Now this isn't a lack of faith. This is just a evidence of reality that God puts you here to stay, not to leave. And therefore, we are to stay as long as we can. And the more we know the power committed to us, the longer we'll stay, and the less our minds and our nervous systems will be thrown out by fear and defeated by the powers of darkness. You know, the serenity of spirit will give you more longevity than any other possible substance that could be placed in it in the face of the earth. And all the doctors in the world couldn't keep you alive if your spirit's defeated or if it's ready to go. Now, I want you to know this. Apostle Paul says, therefore, uh, we have a celestial body and we have a physical one and if something happened to this we wouldn't be found naked or without a celestial clothing or a pl dwelling place. We have a celestial being that this consciousness can dwell in. The Apostle Paul also tells us this, that the eternal Yahweh God who commanded the light to shine out of the darkness, he has shined into our hearts. He will give unto us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God that was in the face of Jesus Christ. The power, the light, the command of an incarnate Son in tune with the Spirit that fills the heavens and earth He gives you. Now let me tell you what this means. This celestial consciousness, this mind of God whose aura and reflection comes out upon the countenance of man, He says, now we have this treasure in earthen vessels. When I look out upon your race, I know that there is a brotherhood of the fatherhood of God. There is a brotherhood of the sons and daughters of God, and inside these earthen vessels is a treasure. Here are the begotten children of the Father. More than that, I know that there is a power greater than the whole world possesses in the fact that here the celestial children are dwelling in these physical bodies. Now Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I draw all two men, you mean spirit, Adam, or all two men under me. There are different words which are used both in the Hebrew and the Greek, but the same consensus is made. Now I want you to know that there is an affinity of spiritual power which God controls. I want you to know that God has placed in your race a spiritual radar system. You say, what does that mean? It just means that in the synchronization of your spirit in this physical body, that as you dwell within it, you give forth certain vibrations. These vibrations are emanations from the very life power of the spirit inside, and they're emanations from the physical body, which are also have their ratings. There's a light radiation of every substance in the face of the earth. Some of them are below the physical, uh, video plane. Some of them are within its spectrum. Now, these things can be denoted sometimes with photography and with film, but we well understand that everything gives forth a radiation. Sometimes when certain light is turned upon it, it's somewhat different, whose wavelengths change and have impact on it, such as ultraviolet light. You have a fluorescence in some minerals and in some substances, and others are affected by different wavelengths of light. But there is a vibration that comes forth. There is an energy field of this light of life that comes forth from you. We refer to that wave of light as an aura. It's a radiation, an emanation, or an aura. You say, why didn't they talk about my Sunday school? Because your preacher didn't know there was an aura there, that's all. But there's an aura there. And I'm going to tell you something about that aura. That aura is the light of the life that's within. And the closer that individual synchronizes his soul consciousness and his physical brain with the will of the spirit, which is synchronized with God and his plan, the brighter that light shines, the more it catalyzes. consciousness and his physical brain with the will of the spirit which is synchronized with God and his plan, the brighter that light shines, the more it catalyzes. That's why you were told not to leave off the assembling of yourselves together because you catalyze this spiritual light 
and this spiritual right becomes strength as it empowers and, uh, you as you move from day to day and through the week. The more you are subject to the catalyzation of spiritual right synchronized by the individual and his mind being in adjustment with God, the greater strength and the greater power you possess. Let me point out this to you. That is because of this emanation of light that you have an affinity which draws all others of light wavelength. But the moment you get an object that isn't uh, of light wavelength, just by the laws that we post it, it's pushed away. I want you to know that Jesus said, if I lift it up, I draw all white men, all Adamites to me. But he turned to the Jews and said, you don't come. You believe not because you're not my sheep. You're not my father's children. You're not of this household, so you don't come. He said, my sheep, hear my voice. But there is a difference between those that are not his sheep. He said, my sheep, hear my voice. But he said uh, to the others, ye believe not because you're not my sheep. Yet he came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He noted also they were not, nor could they fulfill uh, the responsibility of being Israel. We also point out to you that uh, when he refers to this affinity and to this drawing power, which is the power of his spirit, that particular concept of thinking that you call intuition. You come up against somebody and you suddenly find uh, intuitively, some people say, well, I feel drawn to this person and I feel pushed away from that person. I listened to a minister over the radio the other day who thought his church had a particular scientific approach. And so he said, I want you to know that the only way we're ever going to get to reading the world is for everybody to get together and everybody has got to learn to love the things they have an aversion to. So he said, I just want you to realize that when you find you don't like somebody or something, just concentrate on saying, I'm wrong. i got to push that away. I have to like this. I have to love this. And when you get through with it, you're going to have, you're going to have disciplined your mind and you're going to be liking the thing you had an aversion to. You know what that preacher was saying? He says, turn off your God-given radar system and throw your arms around the thing I've given you intuition to stay away from. That's why we're in trouble nationally. That's why we're in trouble individually. If God gives you a feeling of aversion, stay away from the thing he's giving you an aversion to. Don't try to discipline your mind. That's what we call uh, the mind that has uh, ha is a conscience that has been seared as with a hot iron. It has been so disciplined by world order thinking to turn from the thing that God by nature put within you because of the spirit uh, that makes you one with him, that in turn you have broken the sensitivity of its perception. That's why today there are a lot of people that we say are callous. They are callous to the guidance because they have so long operated under the instructions of the world order that they no longer feel the aversions or the drawing where it should be. Let me assure you, therefore, uh, that if there is anything we need, it's what the Apostle Paul said. We don't need to be conformed to this world. We need to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Someone said, well, Dr. Swift, I don't like a mental religion. I like a spiritual one. Well, I said, that what part of your spiritual intellect do you carry on your spiritual religion in? If you explain to me what you mean when you say you don't want one that has anything mental in it, you want something that's spiritual. I would agree. There are a lot of religions that call themselves mind religions and mental religions uh, that have the world order instead of the things of God. But I want you to know that when God wakes you up, he renews your mind because that's where you think. And if your religion is something you can't think about, and you can't reason with, my friends, it's a bondage, not a liberty. Your father says, come now, let us reason together. There isn't anything in your faith that you haven't got the right to compare, to analyze, to question until the dawning vision of it comes upon you, and there isn't anything your father has purposed for you that can't stand the light. If the point has been reached where you are afraid to study or read anything about the history of Africa or of Asia, or you can't even compare the background of their theology because you might be carried off into the darkness, then, my friends, you're not so sure that your life's bright enough to stand the test. I want you to know that if modern theology in denominational hierarchy had to stand the test of this conflict, our race would be lost. But the great and mighty truths of God which are the great spiritual fountainhead of life, concepts, and thought, are so powerful and so strong in God's reawakening and requickening his people with these truths, that this truth will sweep your race and defeat the powers of darkness. The enemy does not want you to know who you are, what you possess. He's afraid you're going to use it. Now the world order is different. And I can prove that to you also by what the Apostle Paul said. But whether it knows it or not, it's vibrating in trouble. 
even as you in this physical body are also vibrating, waiting for a special day which your Father has promised you. Now listen to what it says here. We turn here in this 8th chapter of the book of Romans, and it says, therefore, the earnest expectation of the creature, that's the physical creation, is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. Therefore, the creature, which is our physical body, was made subject to the feelings of emotions or vanity, and is not willing, by reason of the Father that subjected this whole thing in hope, to always do what it should. But this creature itself shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty that belongs to the children of God. Now let me show you this. The scripture says, therefore, we know that the whole creation, that means that the whole creation and every Asiatic and every Chinaman and everybody else in the face of the earth is a part of the creation. The Negroes were part of the creation, or they didn't start in this earth. They were brought in in the days of Lucifer's rebellion, and eventually there won't be any of them on the earth. They'll be back where they came from. But the fact remains that every creature of creation, whether it knows it or not, whether in the agony of its ignorance and the struggle of its strange uh, desires for things which today are in motion and under the impact of its guiding forces, Luciferian spirit as well, and Lucifer himself, whether you know it or not, once was an archangel, and though he had been turned away from the orders of God as known as the devil or Satan, whether he knows or not, all his frustrated fighting against the thing which is right is also a part of the vibrations of his being. Now listen. It says the whole creation vibrates together in pain and in agony unto now. Not only they, but ourselves also which were first begotten by the Spirit. You see what the Apostle Paul said? That everything that's in form and everything that's in flesh and everything that exists is vibrating in the essence of its being, waiting for what? We wait for our empowering glory. We wait for our victory, vision, and understanding to finish the task we were sent here to do. They don't know it, but they wait for the power of the sons of God to put it in order. So therefore, Paul said, there. For they, not only they, but we ourselves also, who have the first fruit of the Spirit. For we were the first begotten of the Spirit of all people. We were begotten in the heavens of His Spirit. Therefore, it says that we also, we wait, vibrating within ourselves, waiting for this great positioning, the redemption to wit of our body. Some of you said, you know what we're waiting for? What are you waiting for? No, so you're not waiting for eternal life because you have it. Jesus said, I've given you eternal life to never perish. Some people are waiting to go to heaven, and some of them are going to wait longer than others. Some of them are never going to get there. You know that Negro song that a lot of people talking about heaven, never going to go there? Well, no, Negro ever was there and never will be there because he don't belong there, wouldn't be happy if he was there. Wouldn't be any way for him to dwell in that dimension because he doesn't have a celestial conscience to be gotten in that plane to begin with. That same point is in the plane he came from, or in, even in an earth plane, properly adjusted to the right God. But let's note here, therefore, what is it we wait for? We in earth are waiting for the redemption of the body. We're waiting for this mortal to put on immortality. We're waiting for life, greater life than we've ever experienced. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. People have been trying to add that up to a spiritual experience. They've been trying to add that up to a change in the words they say. You know today how we predicate salvation? You join the church or you don't join it. When the evangelist gives his call, you come down to the front of the church and then you repeat certain things which he says. You repeat this after me. And you repeat something that you believe before you pray. You come down there from your mother's knee, you were taught that Jesus was the Christ. You were taught this is the embodiment of God. The more you know about it, the more this fills the whole pulse and pattern of your life. But you come down there and you say, I believe that. Therefore, the evangelist said, you're saved. I go on back to see, you're saved. Don't anyone tell you you're not. You are. But the body still wrinkles and it still has pain and things happen to it. And the final salvation and the completed redemption, you haven't got. We're waiting for the redemption to win of the body. It is a good thing for the renewing of the mind. It's a good thing for men to make their affirmations concerning their faith. 
And I can assure you that God's promised salvation to every last one of those of his household and his children that witness to him. But he also tells me that all Israel is going to be saved, and then he tells me all flesh is going to be saved too. So when I get through, there isn't anything going to be lost. So it is not a matter of getting security for myself in the future that makes me make a statement or an affirmation today. The salvation of God is going to be the redemption of his children. It's going to be the moral putting back on immortality. You know, I sometimes there are little people because their minds in the control of darkness have become little people. One preacher said that's going to be an awful problem. I said, what's the problem? Well, he says, the moment we put on immortality, he says, then, in fact, what we wait for, we wait for immortality. There isn't going to be room in the world for all the people that will live forever. But, oh, I said, you just have them die forever because you don't think there's enough room here. Is that it? Let me tell you something. If all the Adamic race from Adam's time to yours were to stand upon their feet in the earth, this place is for And when that day comes, there's going to be a lot of people anyhow not going to be here, so they're not going to crowd it. So where are they going to go? Well, they'll go where they belong. Because the Father's going to balance out the universe. Now, I just want you to know that this is something for the person that wants to put an obstacle in the hands of God because his mind can't conceive that God's got a bigger plan than he just thought of. And that, my friends, is uh, what are we going to do? When we read the words of Isaiah concerning our incarnate Messiah, his name shall be called Wonderful, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, the Richard. Of the increase of his kingdom, there shall be no end. Even upon the throne of David, he shall establish it until it fills the earth. Of the increase of his kingdom, there's not going to be any end. Say, where are we going? There's a whole universe out here to go to. We're going to come and go from before that throne of the earth, from one end of the universe to the other. In fact, we've got kinsmen already scattered all over the universe. Have you ever stop to think how many of us they'd have to be if there was only one of us for every planet and every sun out there in space? Guess the ones now we can photograph is 10 times 126 trillion. That's more people than you could be guessed in the next thousand times a thousand years. So you see, we're not going to run out of places to go or things to do. But there are a lot of people today that want to flit away and get away from things to do here. First place, you're not going to really go anywhere until you finish this job. If you didn't want it, you couldn't have volunteered. One day when the father said, who will go? You said, we'll go. He said, you'll fall down there. He said, no, we won't. He said, yes, you will. And I'll redeem you and I'll restore you. That's why he said, I promised you this before the foundation of the world. I'm your lamb slain before the foundation of the world. And I'm your father who's going to give you back your glory, change you from glory to glory until you shine like the brightness of the sun. I can show you from Isaiah and the writings of the prophets the instructions which the apostle Paul received the great mystery books that come out of Enoch and the Apocalypse of Paul, the great majesty that your father has prepared for you and for his race. You talk about the love of God. My friends, you don't demonstrate it now by embracing the darkness, but you demonstrate it when you believe God and can live with the thing that he told you must be done. I'm going to tell you the best thing that will ever happen to the powers of darkness is when evil is broken and dispelled, and the power that's going to accomplish that is going to be manifest in you, for it is the Christ that is in you. That is the hope of glory. Some people say, well, I'm afraid to use that expression and refer to myself as, as the Christ in me. And they overlook again the word, ye are Elohim, and all of you are the children of Yahweh, the most high. Your father said, I have begotten myself children. What are they, men? No, they're gods, but they're gonna, they don't act like it, but they're going to. That's why he said, why do you die like men? Why do these things overcome? Rise and stand up like sons of God. And you go back and read the first, first chapter of the book of John, and you'll say, where have I been all this time? For he came into the land of his inheritance. Occupiers didn't receive him, but to those that received him, who had been born not of the will of man, but of the will of God, he came to empower these many sons with glory. So he came not to his own, and his own received him not. There's a plague on people who can't translate what God said because some Jew told him how to write it. Right. That's why we've been stuck with problems. No wonder it said blindness in part was going to happen to the children of God until the fullness of them finally came in. That blindness in part has not been who God is. It's been who we are and what we were here for. Everywhere I find your people, they know who the Father is. 
I find the only area of blindness is to who they are and what God has in store for them. And you know, the more God does, the more his glory is revealed, the more his light shines upon man, the more there are those that are inclined to say, well, you're embarrassing God by getting so bright. You're embarrassing God by measuring up to his standards. Now draw back. God's got to be all in all. If you ran as hard as you could run this race that Paul ran, you'd never catch up with your father. Because his glory has been before all things and reaches in tomorrow with a sustaining hand. But you can't please your father more than to be as godlike as it's possible to be. And he wants you to know that he has destined that you're going to have as much godlike glory as he wore when he was in the earth. And when we measure up to that standard, my friends, we can be a happy people. So, this is just the beginning of a great realm of experience. The children of eternity are going to develop under divine guidance and purpose into things which the eye hath not seen nor hath the ear heard. But I want you to know that involved in this is a realization of we're the crisis hour. That here on the earth, Armageddon stands in the threshold. We're being threatened even this week more and more by the powers of darkness. They have leadership that's blind. They don't know whether to run or to appease or surrender. They don't know whether to fight here or fight there. They know nothing about the blueprint of God. They know nothing about who they are. And so they act like men without spirit and without knowledge and without truth and right at the leadership of the nation. The development of destiny would be forestalled until it comes in. Now I want you to know that that's why we talk about this prophecy of Joel. This sign of the configuration of the heavens is now. That's why we point out that God said, I'm going to pour out my spirit on all my sons and all my daughters. And when he throws that switch, and it's already starting with the beginning of the overflowing spirit of his wisdom, moving back upon his people, they're going to think and know as he thinks and knows. They're going to understand. And their spiritual consciousness, which knows all things because it's the essence of the Father, is going to ring through into the seat of the physical consciousness. Yes, one time, many of the spirits of God's children served in the temples of their eternal Father as spirits invisible to the earth. But the prophecies even to the angels was, I shall send my children into the world, and I'll put them in bodies of flesh, and they will be princes and priests unto me in the earth. Now let me point out something to you significantly that I want to add to uh, this point of thinking at this time. I want you to come over to the words of Peter. Peter says concerning you that you are all lively stones built up into a spiritual house. You are a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore, it has been contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion, or my kingdom, a chief cornerstone, elect and precious, and he that grieveth on him shall not be confused. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious, and unto them which dis be disobedient, <laughs> the stone which the builders disallowed becomes the headstone of the corner. Now, you are a chosen generation. You are a chosen progeny. You are a royal priesthood. And then it says, you are a holy race or nation, a peculiar people, and you shall show forth the praises of him who brought you again out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now, therefore, I want you to know that you are strangers and pilgrims in the earth. Now, let's turn. That's what Peter said. Now, over here in the book of Hebrews, Apostle Paul talks about the descendants of Adam through Seth, through Abraham, and Isaac and Jacob, and he talks about the patriarchs, he talks about their vision and their faith, how they resisted darkness, how they fought against all kinds of evil in the earth. And we read these words as the Apostle Paul writes. He said now uh, that they were strangers and pilgrims in the earth. And as he talks about this, the reason why they were strangers and pilgrims in the earth, and this is in the 12th, 13th verse of the 11th chapter of Hebrews, is because they came into this world and they, if they were looking for the building of the new world order they were sent here to build, if they could remember where they came from, how they got here, they'd have gone back, the Apostle Paul said. Now, listen to this. He says they were stoned, they were destroyed, they were slain with a sword, they were times under the upheavals they went through, they wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves, but they had obtained a good report. And they were waiting for this promise. All right, strangers and pilgrims in the earth. You were not of this world, as Jesus said, even as I am not of this world. But don't take them out of it. 
Peace to me. You are the light of the world. There's no other illumination around here, but the Christ is in you. You are the salt of the earth. There's no way for any spiritual savor to reach the earth except to come out of the spiritual savor that is within you. That's why they said ye are the salt of the earth is the salt has lost the savor. You know how those salt lost the savor? Back in the days of Jesus, these Jewish merchants would mix the salt that came across the Sahara with a lot of harmless phosphates and earth in order to get a, a larger mass of white stuff. And then they con everybody. And the more they mixed, the more uh, it lost its savor. And of course, they didn't care as long as they had a bigger pile to sell. Now, therefore, salt loses its savor. They haven't changed a bit. They do it as far as they can go with anything. And that's what they did in that time. So, therefore, salt mixed with earth loses its savor. So also the kingdom of God mixed with the world order in the United Nations or in any other philosophy of darkness or in some temple or church that mixes all religions into one. It loses its spiritual quality. It goes to losing that it has no power. Now, God didn't say you're just like everybody else. He didn't say mix together, it's all right. I just want everything amalgamated to one mass. He said, you're the light of the world. Now, don't cover it with a bushel. You're the soul of the earth. Don't mix it with the earth. He said, you're my sons and my daughters. Rise and do it. So we cite to you that you have a treasure. That treasure is that sensitivity that the God has planted in you. It's more than intuition. It's a guidance that would protect you if you were observant. It's a radar system against that with which you have no affinity. It is a drawing to that which witnesses in your spirit that this is true. One person said to me, Dr. Swift, uh, I would like to believe all these things, but if I don't find all this written out in the scriptures, and I have to go back to other books written by patriarchs, and how do I know this is right? Is the spirit bear witness in your heart that it's true? There is, for all truth was born by the spirit. I want you to know that the books of Enoch were acceptable, or the scriptures wouldn't be quoting Enoch. I want you to know uh, that well, I'm not going to let all of my thinking and my theology be bound up by the decision of a bunch of drunks at the Council of Nicaea. You say, what do you mean? I mean that if the Council of Nicaea, Rome, and a group of clergy had a 30-day assembly to decide what they were going to let be bound up in the scriptures. And every doctrine that didn't fit their individual church, they kicked that book out. They kicked out Nicodemus because it had the power of the resurrection. No hells, no perditions, and they couldn't twist men's hearts and souls with it, so they took that out. They dropped Enoch because Enoch also uh, demonstrates an ultimate and triumphant victory. They even rewrote Enoch to get some flame in it. Oh, I think the Holy Spirit of God protected it. They had to quit by the middle of the morning, and they postponed, as you read the history of Nicaea, a whole lot of councils so they could get sober to death. So I point out to you this. I think the Holy Spirit protected you pretty well to give you what you have. And it's a fortunate thing that there are many passages of Scripture uh, that never fell into their hands. That's one of the reasons why the ancient Alexandrian version had a lot more books than this. But in order to supply a Bible or a Biblical, they just took the ones uh, that were accepted at Nicaea and bound them together. And then they distributed those in the early church until Rome put a judgment against it and, and the printers of Europe were afraid to print it. And then uh, even Protestantism were afraid to accept it. But men like Calvin had access to it. And Calvin faced the great field of his knowledge of the grace of God and of his sovereignty out of what he got by bypassing the delusion that had taken place. Now I'm going to tell you that if you ask your father bread, he's not going to give you a stone. And he's going to bring to pass a witness from every corner of the earth to these facts. He said that if the uh, children of men did not bring his praises, the very stones would cry out. Now I want you to know that knowledge is increasing as God is ordained. And to the wise and steady to show himself approved before God, working that he's not to be ashamed, every little part of the mosaic is going to fit in. We're not going to have an obscure vision. We're going to be able to give a man, every man, an answer for the hope that lies within us. And so we tell you that there is a confirmation to all these things in the Scripture. We don't have time to finish this subject. I think it's basically important that we get over one hurdle that is in the minds of lots of people so that every intelligent Christian knows what the answer is. And we're going to answer that question next Sunday afternoon.
why the flood did not drown every one upon the earth. We could tell you in five minutes that, that if the flood drowned every one upon the earth, you'd have to tear up over half of the Bible because its history wouldn't it'd fall apart. But we're going to show you biblical evidence, historical evidence. The flood did exactly what the scripture said. But what the scripture said, what men have translated into it, and what men have interpreted out of it are two different things. Do not forget tonight, we're going to be speaking on the subject of the shaking earth. No, we are on the edge of a lot of new trembling in the earth. Scripture says in this latter day, we shake not the earth only, but the heavens and the earth. The shaking earth does not hurt you. And eventually, the shaking earth is going to be a great benefit to you. It's going to be a chastening upon your enemies as well. In fact, Dr. Richter, who has set the scales we use in the seismology in California, has an article in the uh, Sunday Times. He tells us that we're facing the greatest earthquake that ever hit the, the Southland of California. He's got that there. Well, that's only a little part of earthquakes. It's quite obvious that's so. In fact, he's putting it in just at the right time to get it in before anything happens. But I can tell you, you can shake this as hard as it's ever been shaken, and God can put a wall of protection around every one of his children. In fact, through the efforts of a friend of ours in this congregation, we projected in downtown Los Angeles, the church we were then using there, pictures of the earthquake that, that hit uh, a few years back at the time of the Tehachapi earthquake. We projected those pictures on the screen. And when we looked at it, why almost all the buildings that, that had hundreds and thousands of dollars worth of damage right down here in Los Angeles were almost all of them Jew-owned apartment stores. Yeah. And I remember we projected those because, I mean, the underwriters have pictures and fire departments had pictures and we had the documentary films of all the damage. And here's the church stands all, all right, you know, right next to it, the Jew apartment store with a million dollars of damage. There. So, so don't worry about earthquakes. But we're going to talk to you tonight about the shaking earth. And you're going to discover that there are many things significant to this hour which you were prophetic in this situation. 